All right, everybody, welcome to The Social Dig. I am your host, Mr. Rob G. And like always, we're going to be digging into the topics that keep you talking and the talk that keeps you thinking. So come on in, get comfortable, pour an ice cold beverage and get ready to join the conversation. Uh, pretty excited for today's show. Uh, you know, we commit to bringing you the best and, and continuing to raise the bar. And I think today's show is going to do exactly that. Uh, we're going to have a fun conversation. We have a, a special guest, Mr. Preston Dennett. We have Mr. Tim Seymour, also known as Anonymous Rex. And of course, the engineer at the social dig, Mr. Mateo. Uh, so what we're going to do we're going to actually not waste any time. Usually we would do disclosure news, uh, but I want to go ahead and bring everybody in. So we'll start out with the man of the hour, Mr. Preston Dennett. Hello, sir. How are you today? Doing well. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. How are you? Hey, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I'm so excited to get into the conversation with you today. I know you have a lot to share. You always have things going on. Um, and just so for anybody out there who doesn't know Preston Dennett, uh, if you've done any sort of research or looked into anything in ufology, at some point in time, you've probably run across something that he was involved with. You've seen his face, I'm sure. Uh, he is a MUFON investigator, ghost hunter, paranormal researcher, and the author of over 30 books and 100 articles on UFOs and the paranormal. So definitely someone who's uh, a wealth of information. And we're so glad to have, have you on the show today, Preston. Thank you. Hey, it's an honor. Thank you. Next, we'll bring in, obviously, Mr. Anonymous Rex. You see him on everything. He's on everything. He has his hand in everything. Uh, Spaced Out Radio, to be exact, uh, doing the UFO report with Mr. Dave Scott over there. Um, and we'll also bring in the engineer at the Social Dig who just built an awesome cosmic watch, uh, Mr. Mateo. How are you, sir? Good evening, gentlemen. Great to be here. And hello, yeah. Preston. Great to meet you. Yeah, you too. Thank you. This is a great team here. So um just kind of want to get into it usually we'll talk to the crowd for a little bit but i know you have so much information here preston so we'll go ahead and jump right into it so i wanted to um kind of just let everybody see what it is that, that we're dealing with when we say 30 books uh he has all these books some of them have been amazon top sellers and i know most recently actually if i can bring up your your latest work here uh one of your latest works here would be not from here selected ufo articles volume four by preston bennett um yeah i guess can we start off with uh with the new book what is it about and uh just so everyone knows we have all the links for preston's social media and uh where you can get these books down in the description yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Rob. I love this series of books. Of course, this is volume four. And they're all about sort of the more unusual outlying type of UFO cases, ones that I would say don't really fit the standard model of contact, cases that are just weird and unusual, unusual patterns in UFO research. For example, this book covers, well, 10 chapters, uh, most of which are articles I've previously written for various magazines and journals, which have a real short shelf life. And I realized a lot of my research is kind of disappearing to posterity. So that's kind of what prompted me to put these together. And yeah, they cover all kinds of subjects. Some of the previous volumes had, let's see, UFOs over graveyards, over prisons, UFOs that are attracted to rocket launches, uh, people who receive phone calls from apparent ETs. <laughs> I know how that sounds, but it's definitely a thing. Uh, this latest volume covers cases of UFOs landing at airports, uh, hovering over and landing, actually, and humanoids are being seen. It's not as uncommon as you might think, uh, as well as cases over dams, uh, a bunch of cases of ET hitchhikers, of all things, which is 
absolutely a thing. It does happen. I've got about a dozen cases I found. Uh, what else? Uh, people have crashed into a UFO. Uh, car lift cases, cases where people are just driving down the road. UFO swoops down and lifts the car right up. Carries it along, you know, 100 yards, a half mile before they come. Uh, so, yeah, a bunch of the weirder, more unusual type of cases. That's what that one's all about. Okay, okay. So, getting into it then, um, you know, the topic of today's show is ETs, Are They Among Us? And then also kind of wanting to go over alien species because this show, you know, the the uh, the objective for this show is to communicate some of the uh, some of these facts to people who are just coming on board to the U UFO topic. Some of those people who just like myself in 2017, when Lou Elizondo came out and uh, let us know that these things are actually real. Uh, a lot of those newer people that are coming on that may not know a lot of the history. And just so you guys know, the viewers out there, Preston is in his YouTube channel. You have to go subscribe because he's posting all the time. And I feel like the catalog or the body of work that he has is super relevant to uh, historical cases and kind of get straight to uh, identifying certain cases. So not really just talking about are UFOs real, but actually outlining specific uh, circumstances where just like he stated, UFOs, which I'm currently reading, uh, UFOs uh, at the drive-in, which I had no idea that there were so many uh, sightings captured at a drive-in. I guess these could technically be considered mass sightings. Uh, what do you what do you say about that, Preston? What what was your intent on, or or what did you find out when you were putting that book together? Yeah, I had a lot of fun with that because having been in this field for a long time, I still get surprised, and that one really knocked me over. I had no idea. I did have a case early on. I worked at a uh, office where a lady came in. I did bookkeeping and this sort of thing, data entry. And she came in and found out I was a UFO researcher and said, I have a story for you. <laughs> Me and my family went to the Paramount Drive-In Theater in Southern California. This was 1973, a long time ago. She was a little kid. And she said, it. this UFO just dropped down out of the sky and parked itself right next to the drive-in movie screen right there <laughs> and was big. She said it was almost the size of the screen itself. Uh, chrome metal totally silent except for this whooshing noise and just hovered there scared a lot of people right out of the theater out of the parking lot there uh and i thought wow you know that is gotta be unique i've never heard of anything like this and i interviewed her uh put her case in one of my books and kind of moved on but it was years later when i was writing various books for about various states and I finally, you know, I did California and New York and Nevada and some other states, but I did Colorado. And I found three cases in a row of UFOs hovering over drive-in theaters. I'm like, wow, I wonder if this is a thing. Because I remember one, it was at the Mile High Drive-In in Colorado. They were watching, I think it was Dr. Zivago. And <laughs> this craft comes down right over the screen like they do. It's usually right over the screen or right next to it. And it'll hover there sometimes for a long time. Sometimes it'll turn on its lights. It'll dart around. It's like, you want a show? <laughs> we'll give a show for you. <laughs> um, I mean, there's somewhere they're putting out smaller craft. It's a big deal. So I thought, hmm, I'm going to look into this and did a bunch of research. It took me a long time, a year about. But I found 100 cases. So this was really just, I mean, I couldn't believe it. Uh, I did not expect to find that many cases. And I think, yeah, they are showing themselves intentionally in sort of a display. Researchers have coined that term long ago, a UFO display, because normally they're pretty evasive, but sometimes they will show themselves. So I would ask how, because um, I would consider, I mean, you have to figure at least probably 30, maybe more people watching this movie at the time um are 
is this one of those situations where a lot of the people didn't report it? I mean, because me and Mateo, we talked about this on the other episode, how it, there's a lot of underreporting going on. A lot of people who have obviously seen something choose not to uh, step up and say something about that. Is is Was that the case here or were these uh, widely reported? No, it's absolutely underreported because most of these cases that I found are sort of resting on the testimony of one or two witnesses, one car that was there, perhaps the family. There are a few cases where I got independent co corroboration from multiple witnesses, but usually it's just one or two of the witnesses there. And yeah, it's usually 100 people, 200, 400 in each of these theaters. Um, and I started asking people early on, have you reported? your encounter because people would say oh i expected it to be in the newspapers the next day but there was not a word and i'm like well did you report it <laughs> did you call the newspaper did you call the police did you call mufon which is the mutual ufo network or civilian ufo investigation uh organization or new fork another one and no people are like what's mufon <laughs> what's new fork the national ufo reporting center so wow. I started to realize maybe one in a hundred people report their sighting in any official way. Yeah. So, and and we talked about that, right, Mattel? I mean, the other episode, we we looked at that because we had we were actually doing an episode on USOs at the time, and we were talking about an incident uh, that happened in the Gulf of Mexico with the oil rig and uh on the oil rig, what they stated that uh, only at least one person reported it, but potentially there were more than at least 50 people that should have seen this thing and didn't report it. And we were just pointing the fact out that that's kind of why I feel like that's kind of why ufology is looked at as such a niche subject is because uh, of the underreporting. So it seems like only a small group of people are having these experiences. However, there's actually a lot more people that that if they reported could kind of validate a lot of these stories and a lot of the, you know, these uh, things that are being reported. What do you think yeah, about that? I totally agree. You know, organizations like MUFON and NUFARC receive five, 10 reports a day. And if you times that by 100, because again, most people aren't reporting. Uh, we're, we're talking hundreds of sightings per day, <laughs> uh, which is outrageous when you think about it. But no, I think it's really much more accurate. At some any given point, someone's probably seeing a UFO. So the numbers we have of how common this is are probably vastly underestimated. And I found that out kind of the hard way. I came into this field a complete skeptic not realizing that my brother had seen a UFO, my sister-in-law, well, both sister-in-laws, but one had seen a UFO. Uh, they both had contact with actual ETs, didn't tell me. Uh, nephews, uh, friends, a bunch of people at my office. So it's definitely more common than people realize by far. Yeah, I would say if you're a skeptic, ask, I dare you, ask your family, ask your friends, people you trust. You'll get the surprise. Right. And I asked Dave Scott, because my whole goal and what and the goal of this show is to uh, try to open up the subject to people who may not have normally taken a look at this or who are, are not well versed. And I asked him and I would ask anyone uh, I would love your opinion on what would it take? What do you think it would take to validate this and bring the message to the masses so that we can all get on the same page and decide what it is that we do next. Like, what would you, if it, if you were able to draw up the game plan to get there, what would be, what route would you take? Uh, well, I'm working hard at it to try to just educate people because I was so shocked just finding out this was real. I can't imagine how people feel when they actually see something and have no preparation for this. Uh, I do think it's important to start putting out valid information because there is a cover-up. I mean, this is demonstrable. It's no joke. Our tax dollars, a lot of time, money, and effort is being put forth by, I guess you would call it the shadow government, but even the mainstream government to a certain extent 
to discredit UFO witnesses, to cover this subject up. So it's really important that people report their sightings. That's one thing I always encourage. Uh, I think we can see that there is an increased popularity with the huge number of shows. Uh, and this is being pushed into the mainstream right now. Uh, I think the ETs themselves are do have a publicity campaign. So I'm kind of counting on them at, to, every now and then to do a nice big display, whether it's at drive-in movie theaters or schoolyards or over a small town. Every you know, there's a lot of waves of sightings. Uh, I would really like a sitting head of state to just have the guts to say this is real, because we've had a lot you know come out afterwards. Like Governor Fife Symington, he saw the Phoenix Lights, but he didn't say a word when it happened. He waited until he was out of office and was a pastry baker and said, yeah, I actually saw them, which you know, I got to give him kudos for that. But Paul Hellyer, Defense Minister of Canada, same thing. He knew this was real, but waited till he was out of office. I want a sitting head of state to say this is real. We don't we shouldn't have to need them to have disclosure but it would help i agree with you on that and that's how i feel because i feel like uh you know we have everything that we need to kind of confirm it i mean especially with all the research that you've done all the books that you've written just your knowledge alone and what you bring to the table paints a pretty good picture of what actually is going on but i guess and i call it it's like a mommy daddy complex where uh, you know, the, the it seems like the masses look at the government to uh, get to be to have everything validated like they're, you know, it's it's, uh, it's special because it comes from them or because it comes through them. So I agree with you that, uh, you know, it's it's definitely something that we could probably uh, resolve ourselves, but it'd be nice to have them kind of chime in since they have been uh you know obfuscating this for the last 75 years um but kind of looking into it what i was looking at um a foia release that uh john greenwald had um uncovered and i just kind of want to read this real quick before we jump into the actual um species but uh the foia request is from lambros de calamajos and you may already know about this uh but it was unclassified in 2004 it states that we are not alone in this is just an excerpt we are not alone in the universe a few years ago this notion seemed far-fetched today the existence of extraterrestrial intelligence is taken for granted by most scientists sir bernard level one of the world's leading ra radio astronomers has calculated that even allowing for a margin of error of five thousand percent there must be in our own galaxy about 100 million stars, which are planets of the right chemistry, dimensions, and temperature to support organic evolution. If we consider that our own galaxy, the Milky Way, is but one of at least a billion other galaxies similar to ours in the observable universe, the number of stars that could support some form of life is, to reach for a word, astronomical. As too advanced by miserable Earth standards form of life, Dr. Frank Drake of the National Radio Astronomy Observatory at Green Bank, West Virginia, has stated that putting all our knowledge together, the number of civilizations which could have arisen by now is about one billion. The next question is, where is everybody? The nearest neighbor to our solar system is Alpha Centauri, only 4.3 3 light years away, but according to Dr. Su Xu Wang of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, his planetary system is probably too young for the emergence of life, two other heavenly friends, Ep Ep Epsilon Eridani and Tau Set Seti, about 11 light years away, are stronger contenders for harboring life. Nevertheless, if superior civilizations are abundant, the nearest would probably be at least 100 light years away. Therefore, it would take 200 years to reply uh, to be forthcoming for for a reply to be forthcoming, a small matter of seven generations. This should, however, make little difference to us in view of the enormous potential gain from our contact with the superior civilization, unless we're terribly conceited, a very unscientific demeanor. 
we must assume that the others are far more advanced than we are. Even a 50-year gap would be tremendous. A 500-year gap staggers the imagination. And as for a 5,000-year gap, by the way, if they are as much as 50 years behind us, forget it. It's quite possible that the others have sat satellite probes in space, which is something that was talked about recently, and then retransmitting to them anything that sounds non-random to the probe. But they have probably called us several, several thousand years ago and are waiting for an answer, or worse yet, they have given up, or more probably they have reached such impressive techno technological advances that they have destroyed themselves. So obviously we know that these things are actually here, and this was assuming that they couldn't travel uh, those long distances. So as far as the species that, you know, and this is where I'm not well versed uh, on the species and the potential of how many different types there are. I know of the uh, potentially the reptilians, the greys, the Nordics, uh, tall whites, and then the mantis type beings. I hear that there are over potentially 40 species possibly. And uh, is there anything that you can, you know, kind of teach us on that as far as what you know about the, the species that might be out there? Oh, yeah. Yeah. This is a very interesting subject because there does appear to be a quite a different variety of species. And it's one of the things that actually kept me out of the field uh, because certainly I'd heard of UFOs and humanoids, this sort of thing. And I thought, well, you know, the stars are too far away. There's no way you could travel using propellants. And that was, of course, an assumption that the ETs are using propellants, which we pretty much know as researchers, they're not. Uh, and it's you can speculate all you want about whether or not there's life out there. But the fact is, we have not thousands of reports or tens of thousands. We've got hundreds of thousands of reports of these craft and these beings. And they're all humanoid, almost without exception. Uh, so I thought, you know, I was kind of expecting ETs to be completely different from us. And that's simply not the case. This is not what people are reporting. They are reporting the main types you listed, grays, of which there are many different types of grays, and also praying mantis. That's fairly common. Uh, the praying mantis are usually described as being anywhere from five to more often six, seven, eight feet tall, nine, in some outlying cases, even taller. Whereas the grays are anywhere from three feet, or little AI grays, um, different types of grays, mid, short grays, mid-sized, tall grays. Uh, and there's got a lot of variation there. Uh, human looking, sometimes called Nordic. Don't really like that term because it implies that they're, you know, white. When in fact, I've got cases of every different ethnicity pretty much mm -hmm. on a planet. So I kind of call them human looking ETs. Nice. Uh, also tall whites, uh, that's another fairly common. Short little blue beings, uh, light beings, uh, reptilians certainly. I'm not sure if they're all extraterrestrials in the classic sense, or perhaps what would better be termed crypto terrestrials, meaning that they've lived here and are still living here. Uh, but have lived here for a long time. Uh, and yeah, I mean, it's, I have to tell you, having interviewed so many people, yeah, they're almost always humanoid, but I get unique descriptions of humanoids that I haven't really heard. And having interviewed so many people who've had really extensive contact, at some point they get some information, which is really interesting. And that is the ETs will tell them that we all share a common heritage. We are us, or what, what they usually say is, you are us, we are you, we are one. Some variation of that. And uh, so what we're looking at is basically we all share the same genetic heritage. And that's why they're all human looking and that's why they're so much like us, more like us really than different.
And yeah, it intrigues me that we have ones that look exactly like us. Because what is that? I mean, that has huge implications about who we are, our relationship to them, human origins, and so forth. Exactly, which is why I have the photo up here to kind of put that into perspective, because you have uh, just a, a meeting in Times Square where uh, there's hundreds of thousands of uh, humans, what we consider humans, and, and you look into this crowd of people, this sea of people, and if there are species that uh, are very similar to us, then it makes you wonder how, what percentage of the people in the image that we're looking at potentially could be uh, one of these uh, humanoid type species. And I also feel like that as far as what we know, because I like to walk in the middle of the road and then get presented with evidence, which would take me either way. So when I look at this, I look at what's common about what we know about them and then uh, what we know about ourselves. So just off the bat, we know that they travel, they need uh, vehicles for travel, they travel in vehicles. Um, and that as far as what's been reported by most people, uh, they're bipedal uh, creatures. So when you look at that, just those two things alone shows that, that are pretty much proven uh, we can that shows that they have a lot more in common with us than we may understand. So, um, and that's kind of why I wanted to get you here, Preston, because I know you have uh, a lot of good insight into the specifics uh, and the background on uh, some of these species. So, um, one thing that a lot of people are uncomfortable talking about um, is if these beings are malevolent or benevolent. Um, do you have any information on if that's a thing, first of all, and then which one of these species might fall in, in which category? Right. Well, this is a big controversy in the field, and it really shouldn't be because if you take an objective look at the cases, you'll see that there's no real evidence. Uh, and, you know, this is what, what I found out, and I think it's backed up by other researchers. No good evidence that they're here to take over, that they're truly malevolent, here to hurt us or scare us or anything like this. What we do have is a media that's very fear-based. We have a government that's basically putting out flat-out lies and disinformation and pushing forth an ET threat agenda and actually staging what's called my labs, military abductions, which are malevolent. So there are people out there who are having malevolent ex experiences. And I will say ET contact, especially initially, can be extremely frightening for people and often is. When people have greys enter into their room, Often what the great, well, pretty much without exception, what the greys will say is don't be afraid. Have no fear. We're not here to hurt you. No harm will come to you. You're fine. Calm down. Some variation of this. And then a person is taken on board. And this is when it goes south because people completely panic. And when people have a very strong fear reaction, they label this as a malevolent experience. And I have to respect that. I understand, you know, fear is what it is. And when you're laid out on a table by people that look a little different, uh, I can totally understand that reaction. But if you look at these cases, when a person is pulled on board and examined, that's one of the most common things that happen. This is when they are often healed. And I can tell you, this is a very prominent feature of onboard experiences. Pretty much every major researcher out there has cases like these, and I can go down the list, whether it's Bud Hopkins, John Mack, David Jacobs, Barbara Lamb, Edith Fiore, Philip Mantle, Michael Hesseman, uh, all of them have cases of healings. And so this is why, you know, initially when I got involved in this field, I was pretty horrified. I kind of bought into the government narrative that these people are being kidnapped against their will and experimented on. And it didn't take me too long to realize that that was a lie, that was misinformation, 
That was a spin on what's actually happening. So when someone has a lot of fear, yeah, this can be their perception that this is malevolent. They're not good observers when you're in absolute terror. And often they will have what we call missing time. They won't remember the full onboard experience, which is unfortunate because people who don't have a lot of fear and are able to remember, uh, do remember being healed. They're given a tour of the craft. This is not unusual. They were taken down to the engine room and shown how the craft works. The ETs will explain to people how they power their craft, which is usually along the lines of electromagnetism and harnessing the gravitational field lines, the magnetic field lines of our planet, at least in terms of interplanetary travel. Um, interstellar travel is a bit different, uh, but that will take you all through the ship up to the observation deck. I've got so many reports of this. They will turn the walls transparent and show you outer space. A huge star field is most common. Less common would be seeing the Earth way far down below, or perhaps the moon, or perhaps Saturn. In some cases, they will take people to other planets, uh, not as unusual as you might think. Also, they will give people information. See, this is why I want people to take a deep look, an objective look at what's actually happening here. It's not malevolent. The ETs are warning people about our own warlike ways. That's very common. They warn about nuclear proliferation. They warn about this destruction of our environment, pollution, uh, the greed and corruption that's choking our planet. These are the things, the messages that most people will get from ETs particularly if they have repeated contact. So yeah, it can start out scary, but really it's not. And at some point, the majority of the people I've talked to who have these experiences come to that conclusion, wouldn't trade their experiences forever for anything. But they will often say, yeah, as a kid, I was scared out of my mind. You know, people will have PTSD, nightmares, uh, insomnia, can't sleep unless the lights are on. But at some point they realize, oh, they're not taking over our planet. They're not here to hurt us. They're not eating us for lunch or anything like that. The, the UFO contact experience is good news for humanity. They, these ETs have an agenda and it's basically in a nutshell to heal, to teach, to guide and to wake people up to our own abilities. That's a big deal. People will come away from their experiences with having experiences with telepathy, precognition, astral travel, past life recall, healing. That's huge. A lot of people uh, will experience the ability to heal, this sort of thing. So that is why I think that we're dealing with species that are benevolent. They're way, way more advanced than us not only technologically, but morally, spiritually, psychically, ethically. Uh, if you wanna see who the hostile species are, all you have to do is look at what we do to each other. All the genocide, the lies, the assault, the cheating, all the horrible things we do to each other. And I suspect that there are civilizations out there similar to ours uh, in that they're not quite evolved yet but I doubt they're visiting us. I don't think they have that technological ability and are probably, you know, uh, not allowed to. Yeah, no, and that's that's what I say. It's a slippery slope because you would hope for the the better side of this. Uh, you, you would hope for it to turn out that way. But then, as you said, uh, it's obviously got to be a species out there that, that thinks along the same lines that we do, which is scary, especially if they're way more advanced than we are. Um, so with that being said, I a question. Actually. Yeah, I was going to bring it. I want to open yeah. it up to Tim and Mateo, if you could. I just wanted to jump in, uh, Preston. It's so great chatting with you again. Thank you so much for sharing with us right now. This is great. Um, and um, you're such a gentleman to 
come on board and, and talk about this with us. Um, so I was curious, you'd mentioned that um, potentially they've infiltrated us and uh, that's um, a pretty big deal. Um, and the possibility that it could be um, somebody living next door, potentially they can just fit right into society. Um, I find that really interesting. You've amassed in your works such a massive library of witness accounts. Um, I'm curious, and this is going to be a two-parter here question. Um, how do you see the fact that you have amassed, let's consider this evidence. Um, how do you see something like this, this body of work being able to be brought to even Congress or some kind of body that um, is in government that needs to be in, in the know and is actually asking for information. Some of the witness accounts are a pretty big deal. Um, but do you think that that's potentially the sort of road that this could take? And then the second part of this is we actually have somebody amazing in our audience. And I kind of was hoping that we could segue into this at some point with this. Uh, you have Dolly Safran in your audience who is a lifetime experiencer that had close contact and things like that with having someone like that even in in your pocket let's say to go to congress do you think that this is the kind of movement that we need to have the witnesses being represented not just the nuts and bolts and the technology that we're seeing really highlighted uh yeah i mean ideally and as an optimist i would love that i don't honestly you know, as a realist, think that our governments are going to be forthcoming, truthful, or transparent with this subject. Because uh, there were the congressional hearings recently. I thought, wow, this is great news. You know, this is a step forward that we haven't seen in decades. This is validation. They have said that there is validity to the UFO phenomena, flat out. They hardly will use the word extraterrestrial. They're kind of walking around and waffling and what I would call mealy-mouthed hand-wringing <laughs> when it comes to actually labeling this for what I think they know it is. And hearing some of these senators and uh, representatives asking questions to, who was it, Ronald Moultrie and uh, Mr. Daly, the defense uh, heads of uh, the d department there, yeah. it was clear that they had not done a lot of homework. I mean, you could seriously pick up just a few UFO books and learn more than what was being discussed there. I, I, ooh, if I had been there, they did ask some good questions. I really liked that they t asked about the Malmstrom incident, which if you don't know that, it's very well known in this field. It's an incident that occurred in 1967 over Malmstrom Air Force Base in Montana, where we have nuclear-tipped intercontinental ballistic missiles UFOs showed up and basically shut them down. And one of the senators asked about that. And the defense guys said, we have no reporting on that. That was their answer. And I thought that was disingenuous. I think they didn't know. They absolutely just lied flat out, in my opinion. And I think we can say conclusively they lied because they were asked, have we ever shot at these things? And they said, no, very quickly. We, they said, no, that's a flat out lie. I'm sorry, but we have documents released from the Freedom of Information Act and thousands of witnesses who are at, I'll just name one incident, the Battle of LA, 1942, 1400 rounds of ammunition were shot at an object hovering over Culver City. This is for real. <laughs> Uh, we've shot at them many, many times. So they lied about that. And I have to believe that they know. They're basically ignoring 80 years of data and talking about the 144 sightings or in a 400 it's now become and it's growing. But they're talking about simple sightings. It's ridiculous. Why aren't they talking about the landing trace cases, the landings? And like you said, the people being taken on board. So I don't think we should be looking to our government for answers, period. It would be nice if they would listen to contactees, to people like Dolly and many other people I've interviewed and all the other researchers who have, I mean, there's an army of contactees out there, a lot of them. 
we know this is at least millions of people. We know this because J. Allen Hynek, the father of modern ufology, is quoted very early on as saying about one in 40 people have been taken on board a craft. I heard that. I'm like, no, no, that's not true. I would know somebody. It turns out I did. But it was in 1991 that the Roper Polling Organization tackled the subject and found one in 50 people have had uh, contact. So it's a lot of people. Uh, I think it would be wonderful if we could get a lot of these people to testify before Congress and talk about the, the heart of the phenomena, which is direct contact with ETs. So talking about sightings and speculating whether or not this is Russian technology or Chinese technology or what have you, they know what it is. Just the Roswell crash alone, which was you know a UFO crash in 1947 in New Mexico, is hands down the hard evidence. We have that. And there's dozens of reports, probably closer to hundreds of UFO crash retrievals. The evidence is there and our governments are hiding. We're not going to get the truth from them. Sorry, I get real passionate. When I... <laughs> no, that's awesome. Thank you so much. Over to you, Mateo. Oh, wow. Um, thank you as well, Preston, for doing this for us. I'm going to dovetail a little bit on Tim's question uh, regarding the infiltration and, and what you just talked about. Many of us who are, have been in this, in this research field know, but as far as the infiltration and the ETs walking among us, as uh, Rob's show title refers to, I, will, I think a lot about this, and here are my questions to you. One is, how are they doing this, and what is their goal? What are their goals walking amongst us? I mean, as Shelley says in the chat, yes, they're here, they're our progenitors. And as you cited, many of the abduction cases have been healings. So there's all kinds of goodness that could be coming from them walking among us. But I, I oftentimes think there has to be a, a, a larger agenda here. Are they really infiltrating in order to watch out for us and to keep us from stepping off that cliff where we could potentially end our own existence and not become that more advanced civilization? Or is there perhaps another agenda? What has what is, what is your research shown you there? Yeah, well, I'm glad you put it that way. What does the research show? Because there's a lot of speculation, and I hate speculating, even though it's fun and it's almost unavoidable. But let's look at mm -hmm. it this way. Uh, there's, this is a phenomenon that's been around forever. We know this from hieroglyphs, from cave paintings, from Middle Age wood carvings. The Romans called them flying shields. I mean, this is an important point. They've been around a very long time probably longer than us. I mean, in writings in ancient India talk about them. So clearly they're not here to take over, uh, but it's very interesting because something happened in around 1947, 48, the early 1950s, because what was basically not being recognized or certainly not in large numbers, uh, but that all changed in 1947 when a huge super wave swept across the US and the world and people started reporting UFOs in very large numbers. And that coincides exactly with the atomic age, which is when we got the ability to completely destroy ourselves. And that is, I think, when this sort of program, if you will, this mission, this goal, I, don't, I wouldn't use the word infiltration that has negative connotations, uh, but yeah, I do think they're among us. I really do. And you can point to a lot of cases that back this up. Remember, there are a lot of absolutely human looking ETs. This is commonly reported. That alone would raise questions about are they among us? Uh, but there's case after case of people seeing ETs where you would never think you would see them. Whether it's on a, I mean, Bud Hopkins had a case of a lady seeing an ET on a subway. Uh, I have a guy who saw UFOs at a bus stop in Peru. Uh, 
gas stations, uh, buses, train stations, restaurants, schools, certainly. So yeah, they are among us. And I think what we're looking at is a situation where they are concerned about our slow spiritual growth and are doing what they can without actually stepping in and taking over because that would be a violation of karmic laws. And they do follow that. There are enough reports that I've gotten personally that show this where people have asked them flat out, why don't you just come down and take over and fix things? There was a couple in Sedona, Arizona, who said that they were invited on board, not abducted. Dolly won't use that word, Dolly Saffron. Uh, she says it's not accurate. But this couple, uh, the Shellharts, William and Rose Shellhart, were in Sedona, Arizona, had a craft land next to them. They were invited on board. It was a very benevolent experience, largely human-looking ETs, though they had sort of bald heads and large eyes and pale skin. They said they could have passed for human with a hat and sunglasses. And they asked them, why don't you just take over? Because they were healed. He was healed of carpal tunnel syndrome and a bad knee. And they said, we can't. It's up to you to solve your own problems. We can only help to a limited degree. And we are helping those who help others. Uh, he's a social worker and she does alternative healing uh, from their home in Hawaii. And that really rang a bell for me because a lot of the people who are being contacted are doing good work. This is absolutely a pattern. So we see a lot of nurses and doctors and teachers and inventors and police officers and social workers and environmentalists and animal and human rights activists. These are the people who are being taken on board and healed and guided and given information. And this again shows the ET agenda to help teach, to guide, to wake people up. They have an agenda to announce their presence. There's no doubt about that. Many researchers have confirmed this. And we can just point to the drive-in movie theater cases as one example, the repeated waves of sightings over various areas across our planet. In 1954, France had a wave of sightings and landings in October of 1954. If you look into it, <laughs> Uh, France, the French government knows 100% for sure ETs are real because they did had a, a wave of sightings that made left no doubt among the populace and the government despite their denials. So this is absolutely their agenda is to announce their presence and like I said earlier, to heal, to guide, to teach, to introduce us to the fact that we're not alone. And yeah, hopefully stop us from destroying ourselves. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. And it looks like uh, Dolly Saffron actually sent us uh, a video here. And I want to go ahead and bring this up. Uh, I'll go ahead and upload it real quick here. And uh, her, her case shows. is the most extensive of anyone I've researched. She answered all the blanks I had, you know, everything she says, I've had other people tell me, but it was very much piecemeal. A lot of them had to recall it through hypnosis. She's overcome missing time. She doesn't have missing time. She has no fear surrounding her encounters. I've talked to many of the witnesses who've been with her. I mean, she showed me the UFOs herself. She's for real. And when she got these photographic evidence, it was like, yay, because <laughs> a lot of witnesses, you know, aren't able to do that. And your book, Symmetry, A True UFO Adventure, is basically her story? Is that what the whole book is about? Or um, are you able to kind of talk a little bit about Dolly's uh, recollections? Because it's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. The, the story is about, I mean, it touches upon her her experiences. She's had so many that really skins the surface. But yeah, she is a nurse, former nurse. She worked at the Department of Defense at one point. She's a zookeeper, lifeguard. I mean, a really good witness and has had contact her whole life. Uh, she's a generational contactee, which is pretty much the rule. Her father had contact. Uh, and at age 14, uh, she had a very close-up UFO sighting with missing time. 
which had been a real problem for her throughout her childhood, missing time and close-up encounters. But she was dead set on remembering this time, and she did. She meditated and remembered it in detail. And she had the kind of experience that I think we would all dream of having. Uh, certainly, I've interviewed many people who've had this kind of experience that she describes. But she was taken on board. Uh, they gave her, like I said, a tour of the craft. They showed her her quarters, actually. That was fascinating to me. Like, this is where we, you go when you come on board with us. And she remembered it. She remembered being taken on board many times. She was introduced to her main liaison, which is a tall gray, by the, who she calls Mama. Uh, the ship, this is an important point, which really Dolly clarified for me. A lot of the witnesses will describe how these ships themselves seem alive or are embodied. And Dolly said, yes, that's absolutely true. Uh, the ship introduced itself to her. She calls him Talata. That's not his full name. She couldn't pronounce it. But she had this amazing onboard experience. They took her up to the control room. This was so fascinating to me. Sat her in the chair and said, OK, we're going to take a little journey. And off they went to Saturn. And they flew around the rings. I know how this must sound to a skeptic, but I had heard this a number of times. I talked to a guy by the name of Jay Gardner, a contactee from West Virginia. And he described the same thing. The only difference was he was 12. Dolly was 14. <laughs> they took him to see Saturn. So he got sat in the seat, was allowed to pilot the craft. That's what they did with Dolly. They took her to the moon after that. I'm like, yes, I've heard this before. I talked to a Navy medic. He had that experience. They took him to the moon. So this was her first real conscious onboard experience. But after that, it was like twice a week. Uh, and I mean, we're talking not hundreds, really thousands of experiences throughout her life. She works very closely with them. It's an amazing story. Yeah, it'd be great to have her uh, come on and talk about it. I know she sent me uh, some video here. I don't have a lot of context uh, for it, uh, Dolly, if you wanted to put something in the chat here. But uh, to preface it, I'm but, sure she'd come on. I, I could, yeah, I could, that would be the awesome. the link. Yeah, if you could, that'd be awesome. Yeah, let's do that. I'm not sure if, how quickly she's gonna be able to do it, but I'll yeah, try for sure. Um, and if not, she would definitely, I'm sure, be willing to come uh, on another time. But here, I've got the link right here. Hopefully, she can figure this out. She wrote, Rob, that Preston knows the video. So maybe if you uh, go ahead and show it and get her on here, but Preston may be able to speak to it as well. Yeah, we could do that. Uh, yeah, we could, we could always run it back when she comes on. Let's see here. So let me bring up. It looks like it's about 32 seconds. Let me bring it in here. Come here, look at my camera. I see it. He's going to do a flyby. I asked for it. We're getting it. They told me to start looking. Yeah, three hour. No. Uh, and that is Talata. That's the craft. Okay, you were muted that entire time, President. Uh, let me, uh, I'll run it back. And then if you hit unmute you, because it mutes you automatically, if you unmute yourself, oh, all right. then you can narrate it. Here we go. Come here, look at my camera. I see it. All right, this is in Laughlin, Nevada. He's going to do a flyby. This is a 2021 UFO it. con. They told me to start uh, looking. This is when I met Dolly face to face for the first time. We yeah, three went to the UFO con together. And this is Talata. This is the ship that oh. she's taken on board. And her friend is with her, actually, I think. And you can see the sort of uh, shape of the craft there. Uh, yeah, she's got a bunch of really good footage. 
Um, that is freaking awesome. Is it just an orb sort of craft or? Well, no, this is more like a crescent shape, sort of okay. almost saucer shape, but not quite. And uh, yeah, she's got some amazing footage. Yeah, that's awesome. Tom King, welcome, sir. Yeah, that is that is awesome. I mean, I have my own sighting actually, and I, I always talk about it, but I feel like it's just so compelling that uh, I actually would love for you to see it if I could. Uh, let me see. Actually, let me see if I have. I know I have it here. Let me do this one moment. I can just say very briefly here, it's so cool that you're getting to show Preston your footage because Preston actually, I don't know if you remember, you did a show called Witness UFO um, yeah. that we did together. And you talked about my family's sighting and um, it really helped some of the advice and some of the things you said on that show helped send me down the road to my research. So. Um, oh, wow. it's, it's really great that you're going to be able to give Rob here some advice on his personal sighting too. It's just really cool how things come together sometimes. I love that. Definitely. Cool. And, and it's def I definitely respect uh, Preston's opinion for sure. So let me go ahead and bring this up here. Dolly is in the studio, by the way, Rob, just so you know. Dolly's in here. Okay. Let's welcome Dolly. Let me see. Hello, Dolly. Nice to meet you. Oh, nice to meet you, too. How are you? Oh, All yeah. right. I'm doing okay. Thank <laughs> awesome. You. So I guess before we jump into my thing, uh, did you want to give some uh, information on your sighting? I have those pictures here, too, I can try to bring up as well. Okay. That was in uh, Laughlin, Nevada. Um, it was actually Bulls Head City, Arizona is like right there. And I got an Airbnb there. I went to Megacon. First thing I ever did with uh, UFO people. And um, Preston uh, wasn't there the first night. I was there with my friend Yvonne Watson, who's a researcher, paranormal researcher. And uh, we had I'd been in a plane all day. She picked me up in Las Vegas and we drove all the way from Las Vegas to Bulls Head to the Airbnb and I was exhausted and uh, we got all the stuff in and all of a sudden I'm like taught us signaling me go outside now bring your camera because I was complaining about not having video evidence now that I'm getting ready to come out it's hard to get because of the nature of the craft and the energy emissions they have and uh, so he said I'm going to be at 3,000 feet it's just far enough away I'm not going to EMP you and I went out there and there he was so yeah jeez so as far as uh so i know preston stated that this was a crescent shaped crap have you are they do you find that i guess with the particular species that you're mentioning you probably have the same craft but have you observed different type of craft from different uh, sure. species they, they have different it's not really species they're all related to one another they just look different we look different okay. here and they look different also they mm. just from different parts of the universe and planets you know solar systems galaxies um yes they have different crafts these craft are not built in the third dimension they're interdimensional beings that uh, build them in the fifth dimension and i know that sounds crazy but it's true and uh, they're indwelled by fifth dimensional beings that actually run the craft itself. It's the only way they can do it. It has to be piloted psychically because it's the only way to traverse those great distances. They open light gates, they're light workers. They work with light technology and uh, it, you can't do it with bells and whistles, it's too slow. And uh, so their pilots are all psychic, they're psychic as well. I mean, seriously. And uh, so that's how they fly. What what does a light gate look like, if I might just interject a question? Um, well, I'll give you the whole process. Um, when we're on board, I'm a pilot, by the way, just so you know, that was my life uh, long 
mission with them. Um, they taught me how to fly. And uh, I have a, you know, in the hieroglyphs, the Incans, the Mayans, the, you know, the Sumerians, the Babylonians, everybody's got a hieroglyph or the Egyptians also with a being holding a purse. And some of them, ha they have the pineal gland in their hand on the opposite side. And they're wearing an object around their wrists. This is literally how you begin a light gate. Inside that purse is an object. It's a detrahedral ball. It's a type of metal. And it is um, initialized with energy. And it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And it gets to about the size of a mm, almost a basketball, somewhere between a softball, soccer ball and a basketball. And it suspends above the driver's head in their chair. And um, they they psychically remote view into this space. It's an interdimensional void that's activated. And Talata or any other being that's running whatever ship they're on goes into this void with the driver. And we work together to uh, create the uh, frequency. You know, light is frequency. And there are frequencies that you don't know anything about, have no conception of. They're too high. They're way too involved. And you would never understand them as your technology is known now. But they can hear it. They know it. And they can generate it psychically. And it takes two to do it. We generate that frequency. And it, it starts opening up the dimensional gate. It's a light gate. And um, depending on what volume of frequency or where it is on the frequency pertaining to what area they're going to go to in the universe, it literally, there are no wormholes, just so you know. But this thing helps them to make it through bent space and time because they leave space and time to travel to any point in the galaxy or the universe. And uh, once you're through the light gate, then the driver would stop it. I would drop it and it closes immediately. Sometimes there are a lot of us going through it once. So the beginning driver opens and the last driver in the sequence closes it and it stays open long enough to get us all through. Thank and you. that's how they travel. It's that's the only amazing. way they can get here. They can't travel in conventional space time. There's no way they die. They die gamma radiation. They would die of old age. There's just no way they couldn't carry enough food and water. There's no way. So that's how they travel. It took them millions of years to develop this technology. And they were helped along. Once they reached a certain point, fifth dimensional beings realized they were coming up to it and they made contact with them because we're all in the third dimension and they had, a, you know, they were brought in and taught and they've been using it ever since. Every yeah, time it's- a important uh, point because this is how they travel interstellar distances. They're not using propellant right. like we do. Right, not at all. There is a type of nuclear uh, that is run on the craft. It's very small. It is produced in the fifth dimension. There's no, any of this element here. It can only be produced there. And it's made into little triangles or little oblong things. And it's almost paper thin. And that little teeny wafer can run a craft probably for a week. And, and it's a type of uh, nuclear device that they use. They, they, and they initialize it. And once it starts running, they can go for a long time. Uh, it's also the power that's needed. This power converts into a type of electromagnetic energy. It becomes a graviton wave. Most people don't realize, or they're not educated here to understand this, but all gravity is electricity. All light is electricity. Everything is electricity. And uh, we, we, don't, we have a hard time with it here because we're in gravity heavy, third dimension, and we're on a timeline, and we just... There are just some things that we're just now starting to see and understand. It's complicated. Yeah, and as Michael Kennedy uh, points out here, uh, Bob Lazar talks on this in the sport model. I guess he's talking about the fact that the crafts yeah. are able to be uh, are operated by using consciousness. Correct. Um, so I have to ask you this because I feel like, and I'm, I totally believe in the consciousness a a aspect as far as we don't uh, utilize uh, all the parts of our brain and that we have the we have uh, so much more capacity to access and that part of it becomes the psychic ability. Actually, uh, no. Wait, wait, let me stop. Yeah, you. Okay. Sure. I'm going to explain it. 
inside your brain, you have a pineal gland and it is a, it's part of your endocrine system. Okay. And it is the part of your endocrine system that can actually see it. It understands light transmissions and it sees like your eyeball sees inside your brain. It transmits signal psychically. You know, your brain has alpha, beta, theta, gamma, delta waves. Okay. Your consciousness is also thinking in alpha, beta, theta, gamma, delta. So do they. This is what psychic ability is. It's not your body doing it. It's your consciousness. You actually indwell your own body. Your body, your, when your parents made you and you started forming your DNA, gave you a thumbprint to make it to, and your consciousness was for that thumbprint only, okay? And you indwelt this body, and you're here only for a short time. Once this body is done, you leave and you go on to something else. We are eternal beings, and we are completely conscious. That's what psychic ability is. It's consciousness. Here, <laughs> the powers that be have made sure that you're not able to use it. People in varying degrees are trying now and they're understanding what's messing them up. One of them is fluoride. Fluoride is a type of calcium that comes up your pineal gland. There's other toxins that can mess you up. And you're actually, quite frankly, taught to fear. That stopped you. And you're told not to believe it. So yeah, there's a lot of negativity going on and you're not allowed to flourish and use your own innate, and I mean innate, this is in your DNA ability, to be psychic and to hear the truth and to communicate with everybody. ET's like sitting up there, constantly sending messages down. People are starting to hear them. They're waking up, but they need you to kind of finish the process. Everybody needs to get on board because we're in a pickle here. There are a lot of people that don't want you. They want you to, to do that. They want you to be their slave. They want control over you. And that's what's happening. I totally agree. So what, for the average person, because I know I hear and obviously, you know, I'm learning about the subject as we speak here. Um, but it, how does one unlock that ability or begin to use that? Ability? Using it. OK. Uh, first of all, you're already psychic. You sort of know it. You're intuitive. Correct. Everybody has intuitive moments like, uh, oh, my God, you just called. I was just thinking about you or I knew what you were going to say or I had deja vu and I knew this was going to happen. Some people can actually sit in front of a TV and hear answers in their head to game shows. Press can do it. Um, there's just all kinds of ways that we are psychic and already operating in that arena. Your, your pineal gland does work some. What you can do is drink clear water. Make sure it's non no fluoride. Don't eat food with fluoride in it. Don't And I mean Splenda, number one. Don't. It is bad. Uh, chlorine is bad for your pineal gland as well. And learn to meditate. We have a lot of distractions here. We're constantly bombarded with too many messages, too many evil, bad things going on around us, too many cares and woes, and they're making you more interested in what's going on with everybody. We're all up in each other's faces. We don't respect one another. We've been dimed out to believe that we're all different from one another, and we are not. We are exactly the same. You are a human being. Your skin color means absolutely nothing. You have the innards of a human being. You have the skeleton of a human being. You have the DNA of a human being. And we are taught not to respect that, not to respect each other and to love what we look like and to enjoy the color palette. It's amazing to me that you're all pushed to those extremes. Look what's happening around you. ET is not this way. It's about loving one another. So learn to meditate, learn to find your focus. Learn to push away all of that. Let it go. You know, Buddha said it best. Put it in your hand and let it go. And focus. And there's an app for that. Russell Targ, who is a CA operative, he was a remote viewer and a uh, expert programmer, left the program for everybody. He's still here, but he's very old now. And it's called ESP Trainer. Go to the app store. Okay. Uh, they've... Uh, worked on it so much now that it probably costs a dollar or four dollars, but it's a wonderful app and it trains you to use your psychic ability. It tracks you and you can see in real time how you're doing. But you also need to sit down with your family at night, put cards on the table, try to practice being psychic with one another, set intentions that you can do this 
learn to see your third eye. It will open. You will eventually see it the better you get at it. But meditate, meditate, meditate. Don't let the world tell you what to do. You become the, your own pilot. This is your body, your autonomous being. You have the right to know how to operate it. Nice. So CE5 yeah. then. Is CE5 connected to this con- the consciousness element of communicating with extraterrestrial? I will give Greer uh, a big kudos for this. He does teach consciousness. He does teach meditation. He's very stodgy about it sometimes. It's a little bit more relaxed than he, he's not as relaxed with it as I wish he would be. But yeah, he has it all. He knows what he's talking about. And he knows that this is happening. He absolutely has workshops if you want to do that. If you want to do CE5s, um, that's awesome. You can also do uh, home meditation groups or home meditation and practice being an ESP and join the SETI network because everybody who's working at this is on that network. You can contact people all over the world through him. Yeah, she's talking about Stephen Greer. Right. He's pretty well known in this field. I joined his group. It's called CSETI. And it works. We called down UFOs, the core group in L.A. that I joined for about five years. Uh, it broke up at one point and I had a bunch of sightings. It is all about consciousness. Remember, the ETs communicate through telepathy. We all do, really. Humans yeah. are telepathic as well. This yeah. has been proven in a laboratory setting, by the way. This is absolutely verified scientifically. We do have telepathy and the right. ETs will hear you. And this is the most effective tool, you know, meditation, really, just reaching out uh, in terms of CE5 work, calling down UFOs, yeah. reaching, contacting them. Wow. Did you have anything, Mateo? No, I'm I'm loving this. I'm so Dolly. Just to, <laughs> I, I have two questions. I do. Uh, one, my first question is about the craft and the naming of the craft and the craft as a being um i totally hear that and that, that's amazing and that makes a lot of sense to me is it is there any biological aspect of that craft as well as is, you know as the nuts and bolts because i'm wondering how that factors into its i'm gonna it give you a being corollary a being. yeah i'm gonna give you a corollary into their technology sure. they have ai the small grays are the worker bees of the entire ets you know, conglomerate, the, the communion of them. Mm -hmm. um, they work really good. And if it ain't broke, don't fix it. They're little teeny guys. They look like little grays and they are AI. They're autonomous only in that they have a program that they know what their mission is and they follow it to the letter. And when they're done, they turn off. They know how to act in emergency situations. Like if they get hurt here, if there's a crash, they will turn off. They will not stay up and running for you they will turn off because their technology is so delicate and so incredibly technological that um, no, uh, they won't let you have it. Uh, they will start to degrade. There's no way to bring it back at all. Um, if you understand what's going on in AI on this planet and how they're advancing it and what they're doing with it, you know that mm, they got a long way to go uh, and they're going to hurt themselves if they're not careful. Okay, so you've got a biological unit, an AI unit that is somewhat biological. It doesn't eat, drink, or sleep like we do, but it does consume a liquid to keep the biological elements of it going properly. And it's almost like a type of photosynthesis. They like the sun and they can power up in the sun. Uh, when they're done, they line up in a room and they turn off. It's almost like stored cordwood, you know? Um, okay, so here's these ships and they're built much like the AI grays are. It is a biological craft that is got a core to it that accepts the indwelling of a fifth dimensional entity. Fifth dimensional beings are non-corporeal. They have evolved past having a body. Their uh, intellect, their wisdom, everything is very, very advanced. And they're capable of indwelling the craft like we indwell our body at its core. We have a heart. Just so you know, your consciousness is not in your head. It's in your chest. When your heart starts beating, there it is. It's right there. Most people say, I have a feeling in my chest or my stomach. I just know this isn't right. That's your consciousness telling you it's not right. Okay? It's trying to hear 
It's trying to get your your mind, your physical mind to hear it. And that's the most important thing you can do to wake up. By the way, I'm going to aside for a second. If your physical mind can hear your consciousness speaking directly to it, you join the two together and you become one being. Right now you're separate. At night you're sleeping and your consciousness is running around doing things, OBE. It's running out of your body because it needs a break from what it's trying to tell you during the day. It's a serious situation and it makes you vulnerable to being told what to do. Okay, so Talata is the name of the entity, fifth dimensional, that I am acquainted with and I fly with. I cannot say his full name. I never could. And part of it is T-L-E-R-A. And I got away with calling him that. He gave that to me. So I call him Talata. I'm going to give you something cool tonight too, just so you know. Um, I'll tell you in a minute. So Talata indwells this craft. He can indwell any ET craft there is from the smallest to the largest. He can actually help operate a mother craft or a planetoid, he can do many, 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 many things. They're all in conjunction with one another, a communion of sorts, and he can run anything, anywhere when he indwells. The craft that he indwells, that I've been acquainted with throughout my lifetime, is the same craft that you saw it in those pictures and on that video. Um, he can, he has picked me up in a what they call a two-seater or a sports model and taken me up higher because of the situation was like he couldn't bring his big craft down. They had to come small and take me up to him. Uh, so that's when I refer to him. That's what I'm saying. It's Talata that I'm flying with. The craft is just incidental. That's the body he's indwelling to get us there safely. Make sense? Totally. Definitely. So well, I guess you. what, when, when, as far as, because uh, this is where, and obviously my, the, the, the my understanding of how this works is i understand the consciousness aspect of it so i guess then and i, I think uh we had a comment in the crowd dana says um says they're not here right now because of magnetic fields so Correct. how would there be any ufos to see there are none that's the point what you're seeing are back engineered from here they do have drones. Now, if you see a little white drone floating around, uh, the only other color they would be would be golden colored or white, pure white. And they are physical. You can, beyond the light, inside the light, you can see an actual round drone. And there are many of them, and they're still paying attention to what's going on here. They have to, because we have a lot going on in us right now. Our magnetosphere, you know, our poles are flipping. Our entire solar system is flipping. Every planet in our solar system is being affected by this. Our sun is now able to fire off CMEs that can hurt us. The first one was the Carrington event in 1859, and it was just to shut across our bow. The, the further and further and further down our magnetosphere coherency is, we're going to get hurt. And we're in, we're in solar maximum right now, and nobody, not even ET, knows when the sun's going to pop one off that's going to be significant. But they can't fly here. They quit no, flying. It's here. interesting you guys were talking about that yeah. earlier because that's a big part of what Dolly has been told by the ETs. We go into this in the book, and I'm seeing it more and more in the news. And there's other contactees getting these same messages as well. Everything Dolly is saying, I've heard from other contactees. Yeah, For the most part, yeah. I mean, she does have a lot more detail than some. Uh, but yeah, this is for real. Absolutely. You can go online and verify all of this. Right. right. So the white probes you were talking about, that kind of makes me think because my sighting, I feel like uh, I feel like they were unmanned craft. I feel like they were probes. And um, and I'm wondering because they were white and I was uh, I want to show you this video here and kind of get get uh, your impressions okay. opinion here. Um, let's see. Is it going to. OK, here we go. So. We'll go ahead and run it from here. The can down the road. Is it really that we have? You probably heard me say before the disclosure is in the hands of the people. What I'm doing today is to share with you my own epic, undeniable, undebunkable UFO sighting that will leave no doubt in your mind that UAP is real, and in this case, blatantly showing themselves in broad daylight 
overpopulated city, which could be considered some sort of tactical formation. Now kick back, put your feet up, as I prove to you that UFOs are in our skies and more brazen than ever before. Side to side and it upends, that is skiffing. And he is changing direction when he does that. He's changing polarity on the field line that he's flying on, and he's actually skiffing back the other way. Okay. Okay, and I use these for comparison, but then my sighting comes up next here. Okay. And this is what they look like up close if you zoom in. They were round white with the black object sticking out the top and bottom. No wings. I hate to bust your bubble. Those are Canada geese. They yeah, reflect light. And they're flying in the geese pattern. When was That's, this? This was uh, August of they go, uh, last flying, year. Yeah, they're flying yeah, south. They are flying kind of weird. Yep. I don't even look right, huh? <laughs> Damn, they look hella weird. I don't see no wings flapping, man. You want the wings, wings are, It's They're too high up. They're, they're at least 1,500 feet up. Okay. Now, this, just so you can see, one day after the sighting, so this is in Aurora, Colorado, a more yeah. clear image of what you saw. So, we looked at geese. The lighting was just right. The the sun was up. Everything was bouncing off everything else. Those are geese. No craft looks like that. Yeah. Now, the only part about this and the thing that was so weird was that they all disappeared at once. They all yeah, disappeared. Yeah, because they drop. If they, if they drop back, in other words, they'll fly up and then they'll turn. And when they turn, they disappear because the, the light goes off on them. It's like the shut, you know, they go into shadow. 
it, it's like a light trick, you know, a, 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 you know, smoke and mirrors up in the sky. Mm. I hate to yeah. tell you. Yeah, no, no, no. And that's why we put it out there because I ask mm -hmm. everyone for their input yeah. on it. So I'll, give you a, get... I'll give you a clue when you're looking at the real deal, okay? They will fly in formation if they're all coming in at one time. They usually drop down in a straight line, okay? And there will be four or five of them dropping. And then they form and they'll make a V like this. But there'll be three on one side and four on the other. They have the tail on the on the other side. If you see three lights in formation and four lights in formation, that's a drone. There's a four, there's seven drones there. They usually travel in packs like that. Sometimes they'll make uh, constellations for you. They'll do the Big Dipper. They'll do uh, the uh, Orion's Belt. You know, they'll do Pegasus and they'll do the Pleiades. So you have to just depends on how many of them are. They never ever travel alone. In other words, they're always in a group or groups of two. Talata never travels alone. I always have backup. I have two craft that follow me at all times. So yeah. Yeah, I'm always always get different answers. I mean, some people say I uh, have Mufon is actually investigating this uh, currently, and they uh, came out and tried to say that it was a string of wedding balloons, uh, party wedding balloons. No, they were geese. You could when they elongated like that, when it looked like they were longer, that's their wings in the back flat position because they'll they'll soar that way. Sometimes they'll put their wings all the way back. I'm very well acquainted with this. I've seen it myself from the air. It's geese. Yeah, yeah, I know. It, it, it's, it's, uh, I mean, it's one of those things because I know. I know. the first thing we looked at was, was birds. I mean, and we kind of went down the list of whether they were geese or seagulls. So we kind of looked at birds that would migrate this area that time of year. Yeah. Um, and, lives. Get good at it and have the intention of drawing some drones down to yourself and they'll show up. Okay. They have yeah. an easier time flying around here. They don't take the effects every now and then. When we have a pop-off CME and it's Earth-directed uh, and it's up in the X-Class range, yeah, they can blow up in midair too. Uh, but generally they'll show up. They have billions of drones, billions of them. So, yeah. So give me, do you have um, like the white, I guess then the white probes that... that, that... They're perfectly round. Perfectly okay. round. No, no detail, nothing. No, no uh, ET craft has divots, rivets, seams, nothing. They're perfectly round and they're perfectly seamless. Uh, also, I want to warn you about something. That if you see a triangular with three lights and a light in the middle and it's matte black, that is a TR-3B and you need to go in the house. Do not stay outside for that. They also have another one that's triangular shaped. It's a type of TR3, but it's up down the line. And those are crowd controllers, and they will turn them on us at some point. They're going to throw a false flag. It's complicated. Um, just if you see that, go in the house. Don't play with it. Don't invite it at all because that's theirs, not – that's ours, not theirs, okay? Yeah, and that was – I had Lou Jimenez on the show uh, a few weeks ago, and um... – you know, because I, I, I like to stay, like I said, stay in the middle. So depending on the evidence, I can go either way. Yeah. And he had brought up a point that, uh, you know, I told him I would be open. He he uh, actually thought stated that they could be potentially some some type of government uh, device. And I told him, hey, I'd be open to that suggestion as well uh, if he could explain to me how they disappeared. So if we've developed some sort of cloaking. Well they have walking ability. That's what that matte black is all about. They can um, disappear from your radar. They can disappear from your own sight. They have that ability. You know, the Philadelphia experiment was not a joke. It, they were developing a new type of radar that was cloaking. Okay, and they ended up opening a dimensional rift, or uh, just punched through a dimensional, went into the fourth dimension. That's why they had so many people get hurt and die, or end up in the bulkheads because you move from one dimension to another physically without help, it'll bond you to things. And they learned from that. And they've been developing, back developing ET technology ever since. They have from even before that. 
I want to point yeah. something out to you also. I want sure. everybody to understand this. They use this to direct you into hate, and I, it, it, it makes my skin crawl. Germany, the Nazis, they had a down DT craft. They did not have the technology to backorder it. All they built were some metal shells of what they thought would be approximate to it. They were heavy, thousands of pounds heavy. They were totally empty. There's nothing to that, okay? They were just getting into it, and we luckily won the war, okay? There are no bases in the Antarctic. Nazis didn't do that. They were running for their lives. They knew they had been beat. We overran them. Everybody did. And the most I can tell you is that a lot of them went to Argentina. Okay? That's all. They do not have ET technology. They do not have bases in Antarctica. They don't have bases on the moon. There are no Nazis running around our planet anymore. Unless it's modern and they're idiots. Okay? Okay, so and that I guess that brings me back as a good segue because I know I was currently um, reading Preston's uh, UFOs at the drive-in, and so with those being uh, so, are using Preston's research on the uh, UFOs at the drive-in? Then what would those be considered, in your opinion? That's, that's showing off to the population to contact these to everybody the governments aren't going to tell you the truth and they decided to like okay we don't need them we'll show everybody we're here anyway and they but have physical to. craft though right yes, you say those are physical. physical craft right okay yep so where does the line get drawn then like so which which who's part of the since we are also talking about species what or or types of aliens uh which ones would be the ones that most likely would be showing up at the drive-in, the physical craft, versus which ones are going to solely be through communicating through consciousness? It would either be what you would consider tall white, um, who are kind of Nordic looking. Um, I am, just so you know, I'm, I'm a hybrid, and I'm part tall white, and I'm part tall gray in, in my genetics. And it would be one of the two, the tall grays or them. Okay. They're the most prolific here. There are uh, ET. The the reptilians have been blown way out of um, reality. Um, they are crypto animals from here. They were here when the dinosaurs were here. They're very elusive. They don't show up very often. They are not part of the government. Nobody's using them. They are evolving like we are. ET knows about them. They are bringing them off this planet when. Bad things start to happen to this planet and uh, saving them as well. Uh, but they don't hurt humans pretty much at all. I mean, I had an, an event when I was a teenager. I used to go out in the Everglades and dig up in the Imperial Mounds looking for uh, evidence of the Dutch being there and the different, you know, seminal uh, tribes and stuff like that in Miccosukee. And, um, I was done for the weekend and I was packing up my gear and the hair went up on the back of my neck. And I was like, oh my God, what's behind me? I didn't know what it was. I'm psychic, so I know stuff is there. And I turned around and he was standing there staring at me 20 feet from me. And all he had on his mind was lunch. And he didn't look anything like you all portray them at all. He was a reptilian being. He was a little bit taller than me. He was a bipedal and uh, he was hungry. But I don't know if he was that hungry because he could have outrun me anyway, okay? I, t I tore off. My canoe was on the other mound across a big swampy area with, you know, sawgrass in it. I went cutting through it, grabbed my canoe, and pushed it the hell almost back to where um, my particular canal led into this area. I lived in the Shark Tooth Valley near the Gumbo Limbo trails and swamps. And <laughs> he let me get away. I know he did. Um... I just, I didn't go back for a month. It's, it, it put me on edge to know that I just witnessed an, a being, an intelligent being um, that let me go, you know, and who was thinking I might make a nice tasty snack, but he let me get, um, he was not wearing clothes. He had a kind of like a, a sort of a something on. Okay. Uh, he looked like, you know how the Indians were way back when they had their poles and their, their, bangles and their beads and kind of he was almost like that he had stuff on i didn't pay attention to it that much 
I just know he was wearing something like that, you know. Mm-hmm. And, uh, in the Everglades, anybody can live out there and never be seen. And uh, believe me when I tell you, I didn't go out there for a long time. My my co-conspirator was like, why aren't you out there? I'm like, mm, no, not without somebody else, never again. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. My guy, Mateo, is not too far. He's in Florida, not too far from the Everglades. So kind of bring him in on that. But Yeah, I live live way out Tamiami Trail in the Glades. We had a big farm. We had a Brahma Ranch out there. And, uh, oh, my God. And I ran all over that place. That was my stomping grounds. And, uh, yeah. Well, coming back, because I'm about over here in Bakersfield, about an hour north of L.A., and I know – uh, and I haven't got a chance to read this press, so forgive me because I don't know the content. But I know you have a book where you specifically catalog cases of Catalina Island and sightings around Catalina Island. So what is your research found as far as that goes, the, the sightings? So I guess let me ask this. Do you feel like there is activity because I know you also look into USOs. Do you feel like there's activity below the ocean near Catalina Island? Do you and if so, do you have any idea of what's what alien species that might be? Yeah, I would like to back up just a real quick sec with the sure. dry bitters because I do remember a case of the terrace driving in Bakersfield, by the way. <laughs> So that's right in your neighborhood. It was a really cool incident that the government absolutely knows about because a report was sent to the uh, commanding general at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base and the director of intelligence at Washington, D.C. So I just wanted to touch on that. Yeah, have to look into that. (laughs) The terrorist drive-in, 1952, I believe it was. Okay. Uh, But yeah, as far as Catalina Island... I started getting reports off the Southern California coast right when I started doing research, which was back in 1986. And these were ocean going UFOs. And I kept getting more and more. And as I did more research into it, I found out that all the researchers in that area were getting cases and Druffel, Bill Hamilton, Robert Stanley, Yvonne Smith, and others. And I started collecting them at some point uh, because I was getting so many requests to speak on this subject and go on the radio and so forth. And I found about 150 cases of objects right over the water, going into the water, coming out of the water, sometimes both. And yeah, down there, sometimes in large numbers. Um, I'm talking more than, you know, just three or four crafts, like schools of fish. I mean, there was one guy at the north end of the Catalina Channel, who was seeing these objects go under his boat. He thought at first they were whales or something until one came right up under his boat and he could see it was a metallic. It was somewhat saucer shaped and they were flitting around at pretty high speed. So yeah, there is something going on there. It's a pretty deep body of water. It's on the average about two to 3,000 feet deep with lots of caves and trenches. But at parts, it's 5,000 feet deep. And we're talking a mile deep. Right. It's a pretty large body of water and an enormous number. I mean, it's mile for mile. It's one of the top producers of what we call USO, unidentified submersible objects. Top producer in the world, really. Yeah. One of them. And who, who like, if oh, you had to pick, I know, like I said, the, the research says there's potentially 40 plus different types of ET out there. Do you, has, has there been any correlation to which, uh, which type might be related to specifically the Catalina uh, activity? I honestly think it's different types. Dolly might be able to speak to this, (laughs) but I will say just real quick, Dolly, uh, that yeah, some grays for sure. Uh, Praying mantis as well. One guy said he was taken down there and saw praying mantis type, but human looking as well. So I'm guessing it's a variety, but Dolly might actually know, no. It would, it would be a giant variety. Um, the oceans of the earth are uh, useful uh, for a couple of reasons. One is an incoming ET craft is very, very hot. It's over 7,000 degrees. It's burning plasma horrifyingly, and it's radioactive as all get out. And you don't go to human beings with a craft that's that hot, that radioactive. 
and they will drop into the ocean to cool off. Um, they're in a field that protects the animals around them from them, but it does cool off the plasma burning that's going on. And they also open light gates underwater. It's easier and sometimes during the day to open the light gate because nobody's looking at you. It's just the light in the water. At night, it's a really big deal out there because fishermen are seeing them. You know, say, oh my God, this big light, you know, and then it just it went out. That's a light gate. They will come in in mass of numbers and they have jobs. They've been watching our solar system for a long time for eons. Um, we're talking 280 million years that I am aware of. Uh, they have to work and they have to do it privately. They're not going to bother us too much. They're letting us be who we are. We're, we're their children and we're supposed to be learning here and uh, evolving. And so the sea is a very good place for them to light gate into. They mass up, they hang out for a few days if they can. And yeah, the deeper the water, the better, the more they can put down there. Since we have radar and it can go quite deep now and we have satellites and things, uh, there's not a whole lot of that going on. It, especially when they started bugging out uh, two years, they started taking people out and they're, they're everybody, they all left. And uh, so there were more and more and more recent in the last few years of them leaving. They started about 10 years ago. There are a lot of them here uh, living amongst you. And um, so they're gone. They're waiting for their, our poles to flip and uh, stay safe. Our entire solar system is being affected by this. So they're not flying in our system at all. They have drones here watching us. They have sentinels throughout the, uh, our solar system watching as each planet goes through its change and the sun especially, and uh, it's a big deal. We have many things coming at us this time around. It's a 12,000-year it's a cycle process. We have a, an electromagnetic current sheet that we're sluicing through right now that happens every 12,000 years. And then we have another point of energy coming at us that even NASA has seen, and they're starting to talk about it. It's a big deal. And um, So then do you believe that uh, the ones, I guess we could just focus on the ones that Catalina Island, because obviously there are 70% of the world is ocean, so they're right. most likely everywhere yeah. across the ocean. But do yeah. you think uh, that they are uh, beings that have that, are, that predate us, yes. or are they visitors? Yeah. Well, uh, they're predating us, the Anunnaki, they're real E.T., um, there are light beings that come here to work with us. There are the grays. There are different types of grays. There's a tall grays. Then there are grays that are about five foot to six foot. Uh, they have different finger patterns. The tall grays only have four fingers. The uh, mid-sized grays have three, and they use a little uh, prosthesis on the end of their fingers to manipulate things. And then there are the very little grays, and there are a couple of different kinds of them. There are those that are kind of bluish looking cast skin, and they look like trolls. And then they're the others that are really, really small. And then they're, they're the AI grays. So that's the gray population. They come from Orion, Zeta Reticuli, and out further out of uh, to the rims of our galaxy. Um, so they're all, they're a massive number of them. Then there are those that look like cats. There are those that look like uh, dogs, like Ra. You know, people see them and go, oh my God. The Egyptians loved them. They worked with them. Uh, when uh, Egypt was in its prime. Uh, there are those that look like birds, um, actually like Ra. They're bird, uh, incredible, but they're still bipedal. They have clawed hands and feet, but they're birds. You know, they have the DNA for it. Um, there are some that are like Talata, disembodied, um, fifth dimensional beings. All of us are dimensional beings, just so you know. You live in the third dimension, but you're evolving. You're going to go somewhere else, especially when you drop your body off. You're going to another realm or dimensional realm. When you leave here, you don't die. So you have to understand that we're all connected to one another, absolutely, throughout our entire universe. And the only reason you're not acquainted with that is you're not using your abilities to hear it, see it, and feel it. So wake up. Yeah, I guess, and and I I totally understand that, and I feel that too. I just, uh, you know, I I the way it, it not even necessarily related to ETs, but I feel like uh, the thing that separates uh, the average person from uh, like 
Albert Einstein or Elon Musk is they've they've found the ability to tap into a part of their uh, consciousness that others haven't done. And I think it's just yeah. as simple as that right. uh, to to become to to graduate to that part of that level of consciousness. Right. So um, with that being said, I guess to kind of bring it all back uh, is from what you understand, because you can communicate through consciousness. Are there with the different types of uh, aliens out there? Are they in any sort of conflict here no. that you would know of? No, that's no misinformation. Okay. Not. Think about this. I want you to genuinely consider this. All right. These are beings well in advance of us. They're totally wide open psychic. They hear each other think. They have developed a moral society, ethical society, wise society, where they are conjoined together in communion. When Whitley wrote that book, I love the name of it. He was dead on, dead right, communion. It is communion amongst them. They are, they're not out to hurt anybody. They're scientists, they're healers, they're everything. I mean, you name it, anything good, you guarantee you. They're interested in everything and they are our family. We related to them. Um, why would they travel all that way with everything in the universe at their disposal and pick on us? Think about that. Why? You know, the only bullies we have are the ones we've made here. The only evil we have is what we propagate here. The only ego we have is what we're working on here. We, we slice and dice and beat each other up and hate each other and war each other and make nukes. And I mean, nobody cares to help anybody anymore. And I mean, it's crazy. No respect, nothing. We have to worry about fixing ourselves. They want us to. They want us to wake up to the point that we see the tragedy that we've caused. And it's up to us to fix it. Okay? If we want to have anything to do with them, we need to reconnoiter and fix ourselves. Literally. You know, and you're not going to do that if you can't use your abilities. Because truth is known psychically. You, you can't lie when you're psychic. You can't lie to me. I know when you're lying. Trust me. You can't fool me. It's important. And then I just don't worry about what all the other dummies are doing. I help those around me. I go door to door sometimes or whatever, you know. And what was it like collaborating with Preston on Symmetry, A True Adventure? That must have been a lot of fun. Oh the my two God. Of you getting to work together. You, you're not going to believe how I met him. Um, I, I decided to come out and this was years ago and uh, they, they had a briefing with me about this. You know, they wanted me to be really real because I am 100% conscious. I know a lot. And they wanted me to understand the, the pratfalls, pitfalls and the danger I was facing to do this. And I couldn't find anybody to talk to. Everybody I tried was like, eh, pff, you know, no callbacks, nothing. And I was really upset. I was sitting on board one day and Tolada was like, well, we know somebody. I'm like, okay, who? And he, he made me write his name down, Preston Dennett. And he said he's on uh, YouTube, which I knew what YouTube was. And he said, go find him. So I went to YouTube and I found this playlist and I found the oldest video he put out. And it just happened to be on healing. And I watched it and I was dumbfounded. I understood listening to him, I can tap you. And I heard him telling the truth. I heard him repeating and retelling all these people's experiences verbatim, word for word. Yep. Nothing in, he's exact. His yeah. intelligence is unbelievable. And I was dumbfounded and I said, okay, this is it, okay? And I emailed him. <laughs> I did not expect to hear from him for a while, and he emailed me later that day, and thus it began. Um, I started talking to him. I vetted him as much as he vetted me. I was um, cautious, you know. I've had a lot of uh, yeah. experience with the CIA, NSA, and all of those guys, wow. and uh, so I, I was very careful with them because some people can shield you from tapping them. And after about, I don't know, six months, eight months, he said, guess what? I'm going to put you in a book. I got a book. You're in one of my books. And he sent it to me to read the chapter and say, is this okay? Can I use your name? Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, okay. And then the next thing I know, that further down the road, because I'm still talking to him every day sometimes or every other day, you know, if I'm not flying. And uh, we're talking. And then I realized, oh, my God, he told me one day I'm writing the book. Do I have your permission? And would you be willing to talk to people? And it's like, yeah, yes. That's why 
basically what I was thinking I was going to do. I just didn't know how I was going to do it. And Preston sat it in my lap and literally helped me with it. Handed that's it incredible. Me. And yeah. you know what? That's exactly what you're saying about Preston is why he's such a pillar yes. in the UFO community. Um, he's so approachable. I know it's hard to accept um, gratitude being in the room, but and hearing this about you, Preston, is probably tough. But honestly... Um, you make yourself so available and approachable, and you're here today with us to discuss things, and we just really appreciate you. And I sure hope I that your huge body of work some t at some point um, reaches the ears of people in power, you know, that are able to hear Dolly's story and actually take that and do something with it and maybe change the tone of the conversation to something more positive and not worry so much about if they're here more about what to do now that we know they're here yeah well you said a couple of important things you know when dolly told me like oh the ets referred me to you i'm like what wow oh my gosh but it rang a bell because that had happened before someone else told me the same thing i kind of took it with a grain of salt I had certainly had evidence that they were aware of me, but it wasn't long after Dolly told me that I talked to a guy in England who said the same thing. He was real upset. He had had an encounter with the Greys who told him that we were facing some real difficult times and that we were messing around with nuclear weapons and it was, they were warning him about all this. And he says, have you ever heard of this? I'm like, well, yeah, I certainly have. This is one of their most common messages. And I had a whole sort of counseling session with him and after or right before young up, he said, you know, I just want to tell you, they told me to call you. They gave me your name. He's in England. I don't know him. He doesn't know me. But you also made another point, uh, Tim, that's important is like you hope that the government folks will find this research on um, their watch. The ET, they're watching all of us. You know, they're aware of you, Tim. They're aware of you, <laughs> Rob. They are absolutely aware of you, Mateo, all of us. And so are the government folks. They watch all these podcasts. They buy the books. they following particularly the contactees. I watched it happen with Dolly. We were followed. No kidding. She's sent me all kinds of evidence of this. And I've dealt with this with other contactees. Our governments know all about what's going on. They mm -hmm. follow all of this stuff closely and they're not coming forth with it and they're trying to counteract it. That's why shows like yours are, are so important, Rob, uh, because this, this is the truth getting out. This is, if you want to find the truth about contact, don't turn to the governments because they already know and they're hiding it and distorting it. Mm -hmm. Go to the contactees. They're the ones who have the truth. I totally agree. And that's great information. And uh, that, that, like I say, that's why we do this here is we try to create a place or have a place where uh, we're not telling people what to do or acting as if we know everything. Uh, the people that are coming along for the ride to learn and gauge uh, how to use this information that you over the last 40 years have compiled mm -hmm. and then putting that into play as far as figuring out where we go from here as humanity. And I, I, that's why I just really appreciate what it is that you do, Preston, uh, in this community. And like I say, throughout all my research, uh, you know, not specifically for this show, but uh, I found myself coming across your face uh, mm -hmm. or your name uh, multiple times. And it's because I feel like you're playing such a big part in getting us uh, to the point where we can move forward and kind of, Regage what it is the uh, our reason for being here so yeah. that's the kudos to you and like i said tim i know didn't want to lay it on too strong but <laughs> it's the, but it is the truth and like i showed earlier in the visual uh you can you can really uh understand that by seeing all these books i mean it takes time and these books aren't just a few pages these are these are good long reads so uh the dedication that it takes to uh, to want to bring the message to the people is really what I really appreciate about you. So I really appreciate you coming and, and giving us your time today because I know you are a busy man. And uh, Dolly, same thing with you. I, I've seen you. I've come across you as well uh, in my research uh, in this subject. 
And I know you have a lot to offer. And I, I, I want to say there's there was I forget which show I saw you on. It may have been uh Dave Scott Spaced Out Radio. Oh, no. okay. Yeah, okay. So I, I I saw you there. But uh once again, I like uh being able to bring people like this together because it's the pure message that we need to get to the people without all the muddying of the waters and uh you know what I mean? And waiting for like the government to step in, I think is just a waste of time. So exactly. I, I want to make a point. Okay. I tell this to everybody. I want you to know something. You don't believe me outright. Prove it to yourself that what I'm saying is true. Research it. ET has a motto. Know all that is knowable, then proceed. Okay. That is the foundation of who they are. And um, I want you to research anything I say, look it up, learn, open a book, study, if that's what it takes to prove what I'm saying. There are other people out there, like suspicious observers on uh, YouTube as well, who do talk about the science of our solar system and what's happening to us right now. They're a very, very, very good place to go and listen and see what he's presented in, in a very good way. He's a teacher. He has written books. It's great. Um, and then, and then always, when you're talking to people or you're looking up in the sky, learn how to be a good observer. Learn about distance, film, lenses, everything. Do what you can to prove it to yourself as well that what you're seeing is the real thing. Do whatever it takes, and you will. And CE5, you'll get there. They'll come for you. The, the drones can hear you. They're psychic as well, and they can hear you, and they'll come down for you. If you CE5 them, they'll come. All right? Definitely. And awesome. with, with that being said, uh, Mateo, Tim, do you have anything to add or anything you want to add at this point? Nothing but love. It's just so great to be invited with such amazing, prestigious guests. And just True. thanks for having me on. You Same know here. It. Thank you very much, Dolly. Thank you very much, Preston. And I will say one thing to everyone watching out there. And this is true for me. This is why I'm saying it. There's so much history out there, so many documented cases that we all know. Right. But Preston, you have documented an enormous volume of cases that I have never heard of. And the whole point of this is what's what's common in UFO lore is just the tip of an enormous iceberg. And if that isn't proof positive that they're they're here and we're engaging them and we need to move on to the next level, I don't know what is. So thank you very much for what you've done there because that I believe is a huge contribution to this community. I really appreciate that. Thanks so much. You're welcome. All right, all right. And what I'll do is um, Dolly, uh, we have your email information. Uh, is it okay to reach out to you sometime in the future? Maybe sure, get you back. Please. Okay, great. Because we we actually going to do something on consciousness, and I think you fit oh, right into right. that for right. sure. All right. So, um, and then thank you so much, Preston, mm -hmm. for your time. Like I say, uh, you're one of the big guys up there, and I I'm such a small channel. I really appreciate you taking the time to come through and kind of talk to our people. So I thank you very much for that. A true pleasure and an honor. Yeah, we all have a part, so it's awesome. Absolutely. That's right. Yes. That's right. I agree. Well, I'll go ahead and sit you guys in the back. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and get this wrapped up, and then uh, I'll talk to you guys in a minute. Thanks. Wow. Awesome, awesome stuff, man. Awesome stuff. Uh, we had some awesome guests come by. It's it's. It's, uh, you know, what more could you ask for? Uh, it was a great show. Um, I really also want to thank everybody that came through in the chat today. Uh, you know, uh, definitely Preston fans. And I would love for you guys to uh, hit that subscribe button and come back. We do this all the time. I, the motto here is come join the conversation. Um, and I would love to have you guys uh, come through and join so we could kick ideas off each other. I think that's really what it's all about. Um, so what usually we would do science fiction to science fact and once upon a time ufology. Um, I think I, I, we, we will do science fiction to science fact and then we'll get everybody out of here. So for science fiction to science facts. This is uh, going to be a movie. Last week we did Arrival with Charlie Sheen. This week.
This week, I think we're going to go with District 9. So, uh, District 9, the aliens have arrived. They, their spaceship actually broke down. They've been here for a while. Uh, it shows the dynamic of human beings and aliens uh, and what that what it potentially could be like and, uh, you know, how we would get along or interact with each other. It's a, actually a great movie. Um, and like we say here at Social Dig, science fiction, science fact is going back and looking at some of these movies that were considered science fiction and then now that you understand that ets are here or that this thing is a real thing going back to rewatch these movies through new lenses so we've had a bunch of good movies that we listed up to this point like i said arrival was last week this week is district nine definitely go and watch that uh leave in the comments what you how you felt how it made you feel watching it through uh this new lens and outside of that, I will bring in my uh, guy, Mateo, so we can go ahead and wrap this up. Have you seen District 9, Mateo? Yes, I have. And that's a great pick, man. I love it. And I was going to write something in the comment. It should come as no shock to anyone how we humans mistreated the aliens in that movie and what might actually happen now that we, you know, if it were to happen. And yes, I see it in a totally different lens. Uh, I have to go back and rewatch that one uh, because it's been a while, but you're, you're totally spot on it. It's more likely to be true than one might be willing to uh, give credence to. <laughs> right. Right. And this could be, this could be, uh, you know, the reality at some point down the line. So uh, mm -hmm. it'd be crazy to think that, but um mateo you know we we've, we've done show a lot of shows together here you know the message here at the social dig is to uh unite humanity or kind of just uh bring the information for everyone to sift through themselves we're not here to tell anybody to think a certain way or this is right or this is wrong this is more of coming together getting the facts and then you do with them what you will uh, but the goal is for us to all come together as humanity and make the decision uh, or, or come together to try to help each other make the decision on where we go next. Yes. So all for the greater good. What did you uh, so as far as uh, these different species, I know we just did USOs the other day. What were you what, how do you feel about that conversation? It doesn't surprise me one bit. I, I accept uh, what Dolly and Preston say there, because you and I have heard from numerous sources, Tim included, about all of the different species and what one means and what the other, what one intends and what the other intends. Listen, if they were malevolent, we wouldn't be here right now. And we would have seen that, those workings long ago. That's obviously not the case. They are not here for our demise. So I agree with Dolly and Preston's assessment there and what their purpose is and what they mean for us is yet to be seen, but it's certainly, I, I believe it's for the greater good. And I, I kind of want them to be here for, to do good things and to, mm -hmm. you know, be positive and have fun with this. I really uh, hope that that's the outcome, but the important thing is that we stick together. So regardless of what the outcome is, we need to come together to interface with them to figure out what our place is in this, I guess, galactic federation. Yes. So, all right, Mattel, let's go ahead and let everybody go for the social dig. Thanks for everybody that came through. I guess we could run through the comments again real quick because we had uh, quite a few today and I mm -hmm. totally appreciate you all coming through, Michael Kennedy. Uh, Terry Hall for sure. Uh, yep. C C Tech, Mr. Mattel. Thank you. Dana Matthews. She said that she just subbed. Thank you so much for subbing. Uh, we will not let you down. We we bring the heat. We try to bring the heat every time. And uh, we we definitely it's definitely gonna be a place where you can come and have an interesting conversation. So uh Dolly Saffron, thanks so much for coming and participating. Uh, we got Mr. Tom King, Mr. Phoenix Slice. Thank you, sir, for coming through. 
uh let's see what else do we got magneticus here? was here early on oh his mr magneticus died. his phone died so he had to leave us early oh he'll be rewatched yeah magneticus mm -hmm. thanks for coming through you always support the show and yeah i just had a ball today so uh let's go ahead and do this great show thank you michael and like we like to say here at the social dig um treat each other kindly go out and do something good in the world put some positive energy out there uh positive energy is really what makes the world go around uh thanks again for you guys coming through to the social dig take care